Okay. Um, I want to start out, uh, I want to first of all wish everybody a happy summer solstice. Um, as it happens, my 60th birthday is tomorrow. And that put me in a reflective mood. So I'm going to say, I'm going to, oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to fold in some of my uh, talk with some observations about where complex systems has gone during the, uh, I don't know, 25 years or 30 years that I've been involved in it, 30 years. Um, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit, let, let me just say it's an honor, it's a particular honor for me to be invited to NetSci. I've never actually been to this conference before. And most of my work hasn't been in network science. In fact, I was kind of surprised when I got invited because it happens that now I am doing some work that's very much about networks, and, but most of it isn't even done yet. So somehow, um, Brian and Luis must have um, sort of known what I was doing. But it's particularly nice for me because it allows me to make contact with a major part of complex systems that I haven't been very connected to. So, I got involved in, in uh, complex systems and work that grew out of the work I was doing on dynamical systems and chaos, or maybe just because I did dynamical systems and chaos because they didn't have complex systems and it was the closest I could get. Um, but back then, we were really interested in one thing, I would say, which is self-organization. We wanted to somehow know how, how one gets emergent behavior from simple uh, units like neurons or uh, lymphocytes um, or people participating in a society. We had very little good data, and, and so there's a lot of conceptual work, but frankly, very little of the sort of practical work that characterizes complex systems now, and, and uh, which I think is a really good thing. Um, you know, the whole word complex systems, I remember in 1988 when um, the management at, at Los Alamos asked me if I would be willing to uh, start a group in complex systems I said, of course not, I don't want to be a group leader. And they said, well, if you don't start the group in complex systems, we're going to ask that guy to start it. And I said, OK, I'll do it. And, um, um, but uh, at the time, we had a debate about what to call our group. And actually, for a long time, we were just going to call it the Life and Intelligence Group. And then we decided that was too restrictive, because we wanted to do other things than that. And we decided complex systems would allow us to do just about anything we wanted. And since then, that phrase has gone on to be used by a lot of people. And I think, in fact, that intuition has proven to be true, that life and intelligence would have been much too restrictive uh, and witnessed by what I'm working on now. Um, now, I'm going to indulge myself a little bit by saying a bit about some models and an approach that I did uh, with Norman Packard back in the mid-'80s. So it's a long time ago now, more, more, than, th more than 25 years. Um, we pushed or developed an idea that at the time we called metadynamics. Um, the idea was to build network models that allowed us to focus attention on the things that matter and ignore, well, I should say actually in general, I think what network models do for you is allow you to focus attention on the things that matter and ignore everything else. But in the metadynamics models, we, um, we created dynamical systems that lived on a network. The dynamics induced the changes in the network and then the changes in the network changed the dynamical system, which in turn could induce further changes in the network. So in particular, uh, thinking about problems of origin of life and the immune system and several other things, where one wants to model a system of chemical reactions, we worried about, uh, we, we came up with a way to deal with the problem that in a system of chemical reactions, you have an, an infinite dimensional space. You have a potentially infinite number of chemical reactions. And in fact, um, uh, somebody yesterday computed you know, that there were 10 to the 222 possibilities for networks, for biological networks. I mean, it's even worse than that with chemical reactions. So our concept was to, to come up with a way to focus on the chemical reactions that mattered and neglect everything else and do so in an evolving, dynamic way. So we wrote a series of four papers which I'm showing up here. Um, the two sort of seminal papers were in 1986. And then it was, it was with Stuart Kaufman, one of them, the other one with Alan Perlson, who's a theoretical immunologist. Uh, and then the latter two are with Rick Bagley, and one of them, Walter Fontana. Rick Bagley was my graduate student at the time. Now, to my utter amazement, these papers have slumbered in the literature for 25 years. And 
uh, last year when I was getting my CV ready to uh, apply for a job at Oxford, I, to my complete shock, discovered that our immune system paper now has about 1,000 citations. And I think three years ago, I probably had 50. Um, I, I'm not quite sure why that's happening, to be honest. I, I think it's because in that paper, we invented an algorithm uh, whereby to model a chemical reaction, we took a bit string and we said, and we assigned every node a bit string, and then we assigned reactivities between the nodes based on the complementary match of the big bit string, trying to mimic what's happening physically when you make a chemical bond, a, compli a complicated chemical bond like you have, say, when you're looking at the way uh, the immune system bonds. And I think these papers are actually getting cited by people in networks who are using that algorithm for that for whatever purpose, I don't know. But I, I really don't know. If anybody knows, I, I'm curious. Of course, I could go try and look up the papers, but that'd be much too much work. Um, but, but so what I wanted to do today is say just a little bit about these other papers, which actually would have, I almost like better, because in that we actually did something to show how one can get self-organization. We focused on autocatalytic networks. And let me also say, this theme is going to work back through the economic models that I'm going to present a bit later. Um, we focused on the question of autocatalysis, and in particular, the fact that, um, by the way, do we have a, a laser pointer, by any chance? No? OK, I have a finger. Um, so we, have, we imagine you have two species, A and B. Think of them being supplied in a constant stream, and they're the food set. And we have some catalyst, E. And we have two reactions. We can either make A, B, or B, A. Um, well, equilibrium, this doesn't matter. But, but outside of equilibrium at steady state, if the reaction to make A, B is catalyzed and the other one isn't, you'll end up at steady state with much higher concentrations of, um, OK, great, thank you. You'll end up with much higher concentrations of A, B. So the question was, um, can you start with some kind of a homogeneous soup of building blocks and a food set that's going to be some small set of things, something this organism we're going to build can eat. And can you arrive at something that just makes a few specific things? And can you show that there's some information involved and those things evolve through time? So we imagined a series of um, ligation reactions and cleavage reactions where um, you could say have A and B, and they could make BB, or they could make AB, and sorry, the, uh, the um, resolution's kind of poor. I warn you, these are old figures. Um, and, but you can make various strings representing different chemicals, and you have a food set, and you, you pump these in, and then, then the goal is to make some focused set of things rather than just getting a smear that goes over the entire food set and to try and get it to evolve. And, so we had a simulation where we start with a simple food set, and we implement kinetics for catalyzed reactions. Uh, so at some point in time, we have some specific set of, of chemical species that are sitting in this reactor. And then we define the shadow as the chemical species that can be re uh, arrived at through uncatalyzed spontaneous reactions from the food step. And we call it a shadow because you expect those to be at much higher concentration because there's things around that can make them at least from spontaneous reactions. And then we look at the probability for creating something new. If it's high enough, warranted on what's going on in the network that we have, we create something new. Then we check and see if it has any new catalyzed reactions. And if it does, we add it into the set and we start simulating up from a concentration of one molecule. And we see whether the concentration grows through time or shrinks. And if it grows enough to join the set, we, we install it. If it dies out, we take it away. And, um, and now we have a new set. And we keep repeating that again and again. And in fact, so what did we get? Um, wait, sorry. Um, let me just say that uh, before, I, before I go forward, when we do this, we, we end up with some network of catalyzed reactions. And I'm showing you the picture there. Um, we, we, in this representation, the food set is shown by double circles. And then we create through catalyzed reactions. Um, so say, if you go from, oh, let's take this and this, have a catalyzed reaction that makes this. It's catalyzed by something over here and something over here. 
makes new things. And so this, this network, this bipartite network actually, grows through time. Um, now, the question is what happens? So I'm now going to show you a representation of the chemical concentrations where the species of each chemical are represented by the height on this axis here and understand the xy axis. Let's go back to this Mandela, as we called it. And so imagine that we're looking down from the top. And if this has a high concentration, it'll be that cone on the top. And in fact, at equilibrium, what you can see is if, say, these are in the food set, these should have high concentrations. These will have lower concentrations, lower concentrations, and so on down the line. So that if you look down on that from the top, you'll get something that looks like this picture. But now we, we let the system start evolving. And we also spend a lot of time playing around with the parameters to get some parameters that make this that are favorable towards making this happen. And through time, what you see is you end up with something like this, where some of the chemical species end up with high concentrations much higher than that of the surrounding background. And in fact, we could evolve things like this, where you see a few chemical species at very high concentrations, and everything else is sitting at its equilibrium background. Now, so what we achieved is that we have some evolving set of specific chemical species. They're capable of digesting many possible food sets. We could show that we could make alterations in the food set. And there was some big set of allowable alterations that the system could adapt to and remain more or less unchanged um, under changes in the food set. Um, the composition of the species evolved through time under random variation and selection. And selection being done by chemistry. and um, main point for this conference is we had a metadynamic model where we had dynamics on a network that created new networks that in turn created new dynamics and an interaction back and forth between those. And I think that's an idea that's just now coming into its own in, um, in network science. Um, I also wrote a paper in 1990 I called a Rosetta Stone for Connectionism. I have to say, sitting at this conference, I have a feeling that it would be, such a paper could be useful to be revisited. At the time, I took um, four kinds of things that you wouldn't, at the time, even have called a connectionist model, a neural net, which, which was what people were calling a connectionist model at the time, a classifier system, which is a computer science model with genetic algorithms, but, um, but also a set of classifier rules uh, invented by John Holland, the immune net models that we made, the autocatalytic net models that we made, one could now add to this evolutionary game theory models and several other things. But I just basically showed that you could take these different models, you could map all the notation into one common model, and you could view all these models as just variations on each other. And my sense is that um, that's something that could be profitably done now. Now I'm going to get to, so that, that's the end of the first part. I'm now going to uh, go on to talk about the main event, which are examples of network dynamical systems in economics. And um, I'm going to begin by just making a remark. Yesterday, Luis gave us some examples of pioneers in complex systems, sort of early work before the, 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 the main action emerged in the 90s. Um, well, I just want to mention that a lot of pioneering work in complex systems came out of economics. Uh, you know, the most salient one being Adam Smith, who in 17... 76, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, basically uh, marveled at what we would now call an emergent phenomena. How is it that many people, all acting for their own selfish interest, can create something that ends up being good for everybody and goes far beyond the selfish activities of the individual actors? Um, Villafrido Pareto, who in 1896 gave the first example of a distribution with a power law. Um, that distribution, by the way, was uh, used to justify the emergence of the fascist party. Um, uh, so, so power laws have been controversial since the beginning, not, not just scientifically, but politically. Um, I actually think they remain so now. If one looks at the debate, a lot of it is about uh, how we should treat the tail. Um, Louis Bachelier, who in 1900 invented the random walk model five years before Einstein did it for Brownian motion. And somebody who I thought was really conspicuously missing from Luisha's list 
is Herbert Simon, who in 1955 invented the preferential attachment model, a uh, fact that I think is rarely mentioned. He did it in the, um, in the context of understanding Zipf's law for word frequencies. And he, by the way, he did a lot of other things in complex systems and in network models. Unfortunately, though, this tradition is largely lost from economics today. And um, so one of the things I've been doing is fighting to bring it back in. Now, in 1991, I left Prediction Company, or sorry, I left Los Alamos. I was um, on the verge of my 10th year anniversary of being there. And while it had been a great place to work, uh, being a group leader, in fact, I, I should have let the other guy run the group. Uh, being a group leader really burned me out. And, um, and secondly, I was a few months away from my 10th anniversary where I would have been given a kind of silver nut dish. And that freaked me out. So I decided to go start a hedge fund, something I knew nothing about. But, um, um, but every time I, I had been developing time series models, as was mentioned earlier, and every time I talked about you know, our models, and we were predicting ice ages and sunspots and fluid flows and all kinds of stuff, somebody would always say, well, have you applied this to the stock market? So I quit and applied it to the stock market. I spent eight years doing that. And, but as I was there, I started reading the economics literature and I started thinking about the paradigm that they were presenting about how markets work. And it bore no resemblance to what I was experiencing as a market practitioner or what the mental model that, I, that other market practitioners had. So I wrote a paper that tried to get at what I thought that mental model was. And the mental model was is that Traders look at the world as being a world consisting of, of people who are doing fundamental stuff like seeking liquidity or diversification, who aren't really trying to make a buck, they're just trying to do something economic, and other traders. And, and so they think about, well, what are these people doing? What are they gonna do if this happens? Who are the players, and how are the players affecting the market? So I tried to come up with a theory that was like that. So in this theory, I drew heavily on, um, on biology, and I treated financial investment strategies as species. I viewed supply and demand as a force, but I, I encapsulated supply and demand in a simple way called a market impact function. So the market impact function just says if you, if you come into the market as a new buyer and you buy you know, Q shares, you're going to push the market up, you're going to push the price up by some amount. And if you sell Q shares, you're going to push the price down by some amount. And so you, I postulated a rule, more or less ad hoc rule, for what that amount is. And now species A, which remember this is a type of financial strategy, will influence the wealth of other species because if A, for example, buys and then B buys later, then um, B will induce profits to A because a took up its long position owning the stock, and then B buys, that pushes the price up some more, and that just made a profit for, for, for A if A is able to realize it. And so that means that you have an ecology of interacting species. You have competition, and I gave a definition for um, predator-prey reactions, mutualism, competition. I showed how one can construct a food chain. One can treat liquidity and diversity the, the fundamental actions of economics as the sort of um, uh, basal species that are driving that food chain. And I did various things like deriving a generalized set of Lac de Volterra equations for the oscillations in wealth. And I argued that you can think in evolutionary terms due to selection pressure on the strategies. Now, so I wrote this paper in early drafts were in 97. I posted it on the archive in 98. Um, I, uh, and then I submitted it to an economics journal, and I was in for a rude shock as um, I, you know, first of all, it took years to get it refereed, and then I got back referee reports that were so narrow-minded they blew my mind. And I had submitted to one of the so-called open-minded journals in economics. In the end, I, I did get it published and, um, um, in a journal called Journal of Economic Behavioral and Organ Organization. Now, in economics, you have to realize the journals are actually ranked from 1 to 360. And an economist knows immediately which journal, if you, know, if you say a journal, they can guess at roughly where the ranking is. If it's one of the top 30, they probably know the ranking by heart. And Jibo is, you know, it's 35. So um, that's in the top 10%, but 
The distribution of citations is so heavy-tailed that, as an example, I, I met the current editor-in-chief of GBO a few years ago at a conference, and he said, um, you know, you really should submit another paper to GBO. The paper that you submitted um, has gotten more citations than any paper in the past five years. I said, oh, that's amazing. How many citations does it have? And he says, 50. <laughs> and so that kind of shows you how that works. Now, I did actually get the full paper that didn't have the sort of ecology and evolution removed, um, um, which the referees made me do. And because I happened to meet a guy, uh, Giovanni Dozzi, and I talked, and he said, you mean market force ecology and evolution number never got published? I'll just put it in as is. So he put it in his journal, which is way down the hierarchy. Um, and uh, so it did finally get published in 2002. Just to comment on culture. Um, now, I'm going to talk more, as I, as I said in here, a key idea in this was market impact. The idea that buying and selling pushes on prices, and you can, do, you can do something that's a lot simpler and more lightweight than a supply and demand function, and is, is unlike supply and demand functions, easy to measure empirically. I actually first noticed this in 1996, when prediction company, we were analyzing our own trades, and we actually backed out the market impact function of our own trades. Um, and so, to define things a little more carefully, market impact is the expected shift in price due to buying or selling. So if you have, in particular, I'm going to think about a large buy order. If you break it up into pieces and execute them a, a little at a time, which is what people do, uh, Warren Buffett, for example, has been known to take nine months to work his way into a position. He bought 5.5% he bought of IBM recently and got a waiver from the SEC on reporting his positions quarterly because he would have revealed what he was doing. Um, and this was reported in the New York Times w once he'd finished doing what he was doing. Um, so people can take a very long time, but, but the market impact is just the expected value of the difference between the final price and the initial price divided by the initial price. Um, now, in contrast to early theoretical work, um, market impact is not a linear function. It's actually a heavily concave function, meaning that it has a decreasing slope. Or another way to put it is that if you have a big order, you actually have less impact per share than you do if you have a small order, which was, by the way, the opposite of what everybody intuitively thought in the 90s. We were worried at prediction company that the very opposite would be true. We would have thought as we got big, we would have even more impact per share, which would have been very bad news for us. But the opposite is true, which was actually good news because it meant we could, make, we could do a lot more trading than we could have otherwise because our trading was limited by our market impact. We change the market. We, we eliminate the, the patterns that we're trying to exploit. And since this is concave, that was good. Now, I show you here some empirical data by Morrow et al. Esteban Morrow is here at the conference somewhere. I'm, I'm one of the uh, large cast of, of authors on this paper. And we show you the impact, market impact as a function of renormalized time for data from the Spanish Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange. So what happens is while you're buying, the price builds. You stop buying, the price relaxes. We have a theory, actually, both for how it should build and how it should relax. And, um, and so we made, in the intervening 15 years since I wrote Market Force Ecology and Evolution, we're now approaching the point where we actually understand what the right fundamental law is. So that's very good news for the original research program I had, because now instead of just having to make something up, we know what it is. And the remarkable thing is that this seems to be a law. That is, you know, when you take uh, economics 101, you know, the professor gets up and he freehands in some supply and demand curve. And then you spend a lot of time learning how you might be able to derive those supply and demand curves by having agents maximize their preferences under a set of postulates that are utterly unbelievable and, um, and that have no empirical grounding and give you the impression that you can have just about any old thing for a supply and demand curve as long as it's, um, you know, upward or downward sloping, depending on whether it's supply or demand. But no, we argue that market impact is the impact function for buying Q shares is some constant times the uh, daily volatility in the market uh, times the square root of the size 
Q that you want to buy divided by the daily volume in the market. And that you know, the, these constants Y vary, vary somewhat from market to market. But roughly speaking, this, this is how the average market impact behaves. Now, market impact does a lot of fluctuating around the mean. So um, bear that in mind. But the average behaves like this. And as I already showed you in the previous slide, this holds not just for the overall size, but for times along the way. So it actually describes the shape of these, curve, these curves as the shares are being bought. Now, I'm going to make a slight digression to come back uh, and then come back to networks. Um, accounting in, in finance is usually done under what's called mark to market. So what that means is that the price that you put in for an asset when you're doing your accounting, an asset that you haven't turned into cash, is equal to the last price that asset got sold for, which is kind of the convenient thing that's around. But smart practitioners have known for a long time that that's a really dangerous idea. And it's dangerous because that's not the price you're going to get if you actually sell that asset. That is, it might be the price you get from selling the first share. But as you start to sell, I've just told you there's market impact. And as you start to sell, you're going to push prices down. And the average price you're going to sell at is always going to be lower than the price that things are going for in the market at any given point in time. So what we proposed is we take that into account in doing accounting. So in fact, what we propose is you use the market impact rule that I just presented to you. And you make an estimate of the prices you're going to liquidate your position at as you go along, and you call that the price of the asset, so that your valuation for your position of size Q is equal to the market market mark to market price P0 times 1 minus 2 thirds, which is in there just because we're integrating a square root function and a continuous limit, times the impact that you're going to have from liquidating shares Q, which is just the formula from the previous slide. And you can also define the average liquidation price, which is just this valuation divided by the size of the position you're liquidating. So this turns out, I think it's always important, but it becomes really important when you think about leverage. Now, so what's leverage? Leverage is buying things on borrowed money. And if you own a house, odds are you've used leverage. If you put 20% down on your house, that corresponds to having a leverage of 5 to 1, because four-fifths of the price of your house was financed by the bank. So the ratio of the price of the house to the amount you paid for the house is five, and that's your leverage. So leverage is defined more generally as being lambda is equal to the size of the position um, times the price, let's say you're buying shares in some asset, divided by the size of the position times the price, which is the mark to mark, well, if P is the mark to market price, it's the value of the position minus the size of the loan you had to take to get the leverage or your, your liability. And so just a few um, properties of leverage. If you hold your position in the loan constant, the leverage decreases when the price of the asset increases. And it increases when the price of the asset decreases. And it's, if you think about it, it's not surprising because if the leverage is, say, 5 and the price makes some change, the denominator is five times smaller than the numerator, and so you're getting, you're getting this amplification and that's driving the leverage up. Um, now, on the other hand, if you hold the price and the liability constant, and you sell shares, that should reduce your leverage. So as you buy into a position, your leverage goes up. When you sell out of the position, the leverage should go down. But actually, when there's market impact, and particularly if the market impacts of the realistic form, strange things can happen. So in this plot here, for example, we imagine that you start from some position 0, and you sell your shares, and you end up at position 1, and your initial leverage is, say, 9. Oh, well, if your position's a modest position, so you haven't bought that much, your, your fraction of the holdings in the asset are small, you're not Warren Buffett, um, then you, as you buy out, Indeed, as you sell out of your position, indeed, your leverage goes down. But you'll notice something funny happens. It goes up before it comes down. And in this case, I show here in the dash black line, where I assume that you've 
you have a bigger position, this gets significantly worse. The leverage gets all the way up to 15 before it finally goes back down to zero. What's happening is that the, uh, these two effects that we have before do the market impact. The market impact as you're selling depresses the price. Um, wait, that's this one here. It depresses the price and that causes the leverage to go up and that dominates over the effect of selling the shares. And because the market impact is a square root function, its slope is very steep at the origin, those first few trades, always the impact will dominate over the, um, the effect of the impact on the price always dominates over the effect of selling on reducing your position, and so the leverage always goes up, which means that institutions need to be careful because, in fact, their bank, if, if you're borrowing money in financial markets, it's not like a house. You, you, you borrow money to buy a house and they let you alone. In financial markets, you, you borrow money through a prime broker and your prime broker keeps a, an eye on you. And if your leverage gets too big, they tap you on the shoulder and say, you've got to pay back part of your loan now because your leverage is too high. They make what's called a margin call. Now, so if you're not careful, you could end up getting you think you're going to be able to, to, you get a margin call here because you're fully leveraged. You try to sell out of your position and you discover you're actually pu uh, pushing your leverage up. The only hope you have is to sell other assets. And if you don't have another, uh, enough other assets or you're too leveraged on them, you may just be screwed. And in fact, if you have too big a position, it turns out you, what happens is your leverage just goes to infinity and never comes back. This is super critical. So, under our proposal, we, we, we have a proposal for, for impact-based accounting. You can compute an impact-based leverage by putting in the average price for liquidation rather than the mark-to-market price, so you have a generalized formula. Um, don't really need to worry too much about what it is, but, but basically what happens, let me just walk you through what happens using three different notions of uh, impact and accounting. So in this, these plots, what we're going to do, this is, this is like what you saw before, except now we're going to buy into the position. So we go from 0 to Q, and then we sell from Q back down to 0. So as we buy in, we're um, raising the price. Well, actually, let me first say, if the price didn't change at all, then what happens is the leverage would just go up to some maximum and go back down, just mimicking your position. Your position goes up to a peak, it goes back down again. Um, if you use mark-to-market accounting, like we saw before, as you're buying in, you're now, um, as you buy, you're, you're inflating prices, and the inflation of prices decreases the leverage, so you have a uh, artificially low concept of what leverage is, but then when you sell out, you get this, this lift, and, and your leverage gets higher before it gets lower, our mark to market, or sorry, our impact adjusted notion of leverage in contrast um, goes up and comes down and warns you as you're getting into dangerous positions that things are getting high. This becomes even more dramatic when we go over here to the super critical case where you buy into the position and as you're buying in, you're depressing um, the leverage even more. And, but our impact adjusted notion of leverage starts going through the roof before a critical value, and what that critical value is, is the point of no return. If you go through that critical value, if you buy so much you're, you're beyond the critical value, then the mere act of selling will drive you bankrupt. And you're in this situation where your leverage goes to infinity. And it, it's not quite as mysterious as it sounds, it's actually pretty simple. If my market impacts 10% and I'm leveraged 10 to 1, then I'm right at the point where the amount that I'm pushing on the prices um, is sufficient to cause the value of my position to go to zero due to, due to my leverage. Um, now, is this realistic? Well, in some markets like, say, the German uh, Treasury bond, no. They're very liquid. It takes a, the critical leverage is around 300. But in other markets like credit default swaps, it's a little hard to estimate or illiquid stocks like Club Med, critical leverage is around seven, say, for CDSs, which uh, when you go back and you look at what the leverage of the investment banks like Lehman during the crisis, they were in the range of 25 to 35. 
Um, so we speculate that they were well into the critical regime. And um, it wasn't just, the, the housing market wasn't their only problem. Um, now I'm gonna say a little bit about data. Um, I'm gonna mention some joint work with Fabio Caccioli, Nick Foti, and Dan Rockmore. This is data on a quarterly time scale on Austrian banks where we have the interbank claims, we have the total liabilities of the banks, we have their total assets, and we have their liquid assets. And, and we have that inter these claims are in a matrix that basically tells us uh, how much each bank owes to all the other banks. And it's a complicated network. Um, it's, first of all, the, the distribution of asset size is not surprisingly, has an extensive power law regime. Um, so either assets or liabilities, we see the usual plot. We see a regime of about two orders of magnitude, um, actually more like three, depending on which axis you look at, um, where things are a fairly good power law. The degree distribution is not nearly as clean. I wouldn't say this is a power law, but it's certainly a very heavy-tailed distribution. Here we're looking at distributions of, um, of liabilities, distributions of assets, distributions of liquid assets, and we're comparing it to what you would expect from an Erdos Renyi. Um, so it's heavy-tailed as well. One of the interesting plots you see when you look at this is if you plot assets versus liabilities, so we plot assets on the x-axis and liabilities on the y-axis on log-log scale, and what you see is this interesting band and then some other stuff that kind of scatters around. And when you look at this more carefully, what you realize is there's a couple of different kinds of banks. There's the banks that are actively involved in trading which, and, and the interbank market, which are, are all the ones along this line, and all of the larger banks are in this category. And, and so these banks all are doing roughly the same thing. They have a concept of the leverage they want to take, which turns out to be around 11, 12, and for a typical bank. And they, they manage their book to try and keep roughly that target leverage. Now, so the main variable along this line then is just their size. Now, that said, let me say that some of them actually have much higher leverages. There are some banks in there with leverages as high as, as, high as 100. Now, let me come to the question of financial instability. There's been a lot of debate about the mechanism that drove financial instability during the crisis of 2007 and onward. Um, there's been a lot of papers, actually many of these papers preceded the crisis, on cascading failures from counterparty risk, which a story which goes like this, and it will be very familiar to anybody in complex systems or anybody who's read a paper by Duncan Watts. Um, bank A fails. Bank B has lent money to Bank A, but because Bank A fails, Bank B can't get its money back. So that stresses Bank B, which then causes Bank B to fail, which then causes other banks which may have lent money to banks A and B to fail, and so on. So you have some cascading failure. Um, which people were worried about when Lehman went under, but that wasn't what happened. Um, one can debate well, whether that was because they were propped up by the, the, um, uh, the government or not, but, but that wasn't the main mechanism that people were actually worried about. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but we, we are able to show on this data set that a much bigger effect that does directly relate to what happens in the crisis is what's called rollover risk. So the idea there is that um, bank B depends on bank A to fund its activities in the overnight market. So I'm going along, I'm a bank, because banks, when they have, the banks that have extra cash around routinely put that up for other banks to borrow. So a bank gets used to every day going out and borrowing money from some other bank. Now, suppose that bank gets stressed. So, so bank A comes under stress and stops funding in the overnight market, then B can't fund its activities anymore, so B gets stressed. So B stops lending to, and you have some essentially cascading liquidity crisis, and you get a liquidity freeze. And indeed, when we studied this in the Austrian banking market, we saw that if we looked at the probability of cascading failures in each of the 12 quarters that we had, which is what these 12 dots are here, um, and we looked at the contagion probability, like what's the probability that there's going to be some big event 
uh, where we, what we do is we randomly choose a bank, like Zeus, we randomly choose a bank, we assume that bank goes under due to bankruptcy, and then we look to see what happens to, to the family of all the other banks. And what we see is that um, the contagion probabilities for cascading failure due to counterparty risk are quite low, um, but on the other hand, the, the, the failures due to liquidity freezing are quite high. They're, they're at least much more common. And actually, if you look at the extent, they, they're much more severe in that um, even when one of these crises happen, it typically only affects a few banks. Out of, remember, there's 800 total banks. Whereas when their liquidity freezes, the liquidity freezes typically affect the order of 350 banks. And a lot of these banks are tiny little Austrian banks in rural places that aren't doing much borrowing. So in other words, that's a big effect. Now, I'm now going to come back to market impact and connect that in. So I'm going to connect to the earlier part of the talk. If um, you go, so I've been spending a lot of time at the New York Fed, and they will tell you the crisis of 2007 and to, was not transmitted, or was transmitted through common asset portfolios. So it's a different mechanism. At least that was the dominant mechanism. And so if you want to understand that, you have to somehow understand, well, actually, let me, let me say first what that means. What that means is it's transmitted via the fact that banks hold common assets. So in other words, there were many banks holding so-called toxic subprime mortgage assets. All of those banks got stressed as a result of holding the assets, and, and that was the primary vector of contagion. So it wasn't actually spreading you know, through a network in, in an obvious way. I'll show you actually in the end, you can view this as a network. Um, so I'm gonna now um, talk about a, an un, as yet unpublished model for um, portfolio contagion with Fabio Caccioli. In this model, we assume that we have N funds that hold an average, an equally, weight, an equally weighted portfolio of K assets out of a universe of M possible assets. And we then assume, in this simple model, that k, the number of assets on average that a bank holds, is going to be some parameter p that we can vary times the number of assets. So we construct what is an erdos renyi graph of common assets, and then we ask how the contagion depends on k, m, and n. And just to talk this through in a different way, we have a bipartite network where the nodes in the network are banks and assets and so we have some banks like this bank, this bank, and this bank that all hold common assets. And the idea is the stress, if this asset gets stressed, that stress will be felt by this, these three banks directly because those three banks have to manage their leverage, like I showed you in the plot with a straight line. And if these assets get depressed, that causes the prices to go down. That means the prices go down, which means their leverage goes up which means they have to sell assets in order to maintain their risk management. Um, one can also think, by the way, in terms of the projected graph, that two banks are connected, like this bank is connected to these two banks because they hold the same assets. So there's a direct vector of contagion to get from bank to bank. So we can now do what's called a stress test. That's become very big since the crisis. Um, we assume the funds are leveraged. They sell all the assets if they become insolvent. Um, we depress the value of a commonly chosen asset. Or, all, or, or um, similarly, we can just pick a bank and um, stress the bank. Um, any bank that becomes insolvent sells all its assets. If no banks become insolvent, we stop. But if not, if some banks became insolvent, we recompute the prices using the market impact rule. We go back to step two. And we see if, under these new prices, which are now going to be lower, are there more banks that became insolvent? And so we have a avalanche of failure. And we basically let the avalanche go until it settles. And we define arbitrarily for this plot a contagion event if more than 5% of the banks fail. Um, so now what happens when you do this kind of thing? Well, so here I'm plotting the average degree k. And here I'm plotting the probability and extent of the contagion. So first, to look at the probability of contagion, and I'm doing this for different values of m. So we set the, the number of, of banks here to be 100. 
we set the number of assets to be first 20, then uh, 50, then 100. And let's see, this plot here, it's um, 20, then 50, then 100. And what you see is that there is a zone where if the average degree is sufficiently small, then every bank owns every asset. And, and the stress is shared equally by all the banks. And providing the financial system is resilient enough, the banks abs collectively absorb all the shock, and nothing happens. Um, uh, on the other hand, if as, as we increase the average degree, Oh, sorry, actually, wait, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong, uh, let me talk you through the plot correctly here. Yeah, so I, 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 when the average degree is zero, when the average degree is zero, um, that means that each bank, say, just owns, well, each bank owns no assets. If the average degree is one, each bank just owns one asset, and if M is large as it is compared to one in every case, then you don't see much happen simply because there's no contagion. Everybody's in their own little silo and nothing happens. As the degree starts to increase, then you start to have a percolation. There is some contagion, and you start to see a, higher, a high probability of contagion. But then as the degree goes up still more, the graph gets really sparse. And, um, and well, well, no, as the degree goes up still more, you reach the point where asymptotically every bank owns every asset. And that's the case I said at the beginning where everything is shared by everybody else. I apologize for confusing that, but I will now talk you through the next plot where we look at the number of available assets holding k constant, and that's the case in which when the number of as total number of possible assets is small and k is constant, uh, then all banks own all assets, so the two plots are backwards, and I was confusing it. But to come back to this plot, what we see is the probability of contagion first goes up and then comes down. That depends on the total number of assets. As the number of assets increases, the size of the region where contagion is significant becomes greater. And, and as the degree goes up, the extent of the contagion, when it happens, goes up and finally pegs at 1. In other words, if you're in the case where the entire financial system is absorbing the burden, if it fails, the whole financial system goes down. So you have this robust yet fragile character that you see in lots of, of uh, things throughout complex systems. Um, to loop back to what we would really like to do is to be able to look at, um, uh, and I should have said actually, this, this stress test here is due to, um, well, what we would have liked to look at in the Austrian bank is to be able to look at failures due to common assets. Um, we weren't able to do that because we don't have the data, but we're able to do a sort of pseudo version of it where we assume there's some correlation in the bank's portfolios and there's a stress of size phi, and then we look at what fraction the banks go bankrupt under those stresses, and what we're able to show is that, well, if, our, if C and phi are big enough, you get a lot of banks going bankrupt, but secondly, you have an interaction between that channel of contagion and the counterparty failures because the stressed banks mean they stop lending and, and banks fail, and all of those things interact together and enormously amplify things. Now, how much time do I have left? 10 minutes, okay. So now I'm gonna end by talking about models of technological progress and loop back to where I started. Um, uh, I got interested in this because I found out there's something called Wright's Law due to Theodore Paul Wright, who uh, is the brother of Sewell Wright, and uh, Quincy Wright, uh, Sewell Wright's one of the leading evolutionary biologists. Sewell Wright, or Quincy Wright is, is one of the founders of political science. He was a black sheep of the family, went to World War I, became a flying ace, uh, became active in the aviation industry. But in 1936, he wrote this paper, postulating law, that the cost of building an airplane drops as a power law in the, the cumulative number of airplanes that have been built. So you plot cumulative number of airplanes of a given type against cost and, roughly speaking, get a straight line. And in fact, we've looked at lots of technologies and you see to varying degrees of approximation, for example, here's transistors in this black curve here, it satisfies Wright's law over eight orders of magnitude to very good approximation. Um, now, we wanted to cry, oh, damn, 
Uh, my fonts got incorporated in there wrong, so I'm going to have to just read this to you. Um, uh, when I went to the PDF. So the idea of this model for Wright's Law that's with James McNerney and was published in PNAS last year is that um, we assume that, well, the key idea is that the components of a technology are other technologies. If you take my laptop, it's got other technologies. It's got little springs and screws and glass in the screen and metal working in the case. And, and that when you're designing something new, you have to think about the interactions so the group that's building the case if that's affected by the size of the CPU unit, then there's going to be an interaction. And you can represent those interactions through a design structure matrix. So for example, for a laptop, the design structure matrix looks like this. You have um, the various uh, overall modules. And then within that, you have submodules. And in the design structure matrix, you put an x if, if, if this interacts with the same stuff laid out across the top. Um, so it defines an adjacency graph, a network. Now, the simple model that we built, which is building on an earlier paper by Auerswald et al., um, um, is that we just assume that the cost of technologies drops according to a simple algorithm. In other words, engineers are pretty dumb. What they do is they take a given component, they throw a dart at it. If they manage to get it to improve, they're smart enough to see that they got an improvement but otherwise, the next time, they just throw another dart, irrespective of what they did before. The only rub is that if the components are interacting, the engineers in all those divisions have to get together and throw their darts at once. And, or they throw all their darts, but they have to sum together what those darts did. And if the sum of the costs doesn't result in improvement, then there's no improvement. So obviously, the more complex the technology, the harder it's going to be to make improvements, the more you're going to have to work on things like modularity. Now, we were able to show that this model gives rise to Wright's Law, and that the exponent for improvement here in Wright's Law, the so-called progress ratio, um, is, can be written as 1 over some number gamma, which has to do with the inherent difficulty of the problem, times some number d star, where d star, in the simple case that the design structure matrix, you say, just have d things are always connected to d other things, so you have a homogeneous degree network, then this is just the degree of the network. But more generally, it depends on subtleties of the topology that we enumerate, we, we discuss in this paper. But the point being that the more complex the technology is based on this uh, generalized degree, the slower the technology will improve. And we showed, I, I'm actually, since I'm getting close to the end, I'm going to, uh, five minutes, and I'm hoping for maybe a question. We'll see. Um, I, I never really liked this model, though I think it was a nice start. So we're building a new model. Um, in our new model, we, we take advantage of the fact that technologies evolve from, a diff, from existing technologies. And so it's not just that in the factory, this, my laptop is being assembled from all these other components. These components are being built all around the world by whole different sectors of the economy. And the rate at which one makes te technological improvement is building on the base of all of those sectors. So if I'm in Silicon Valley, um, you, can, you can go over and just you know, buy a chip or talk to somebody who has the latest and best technology. So the model that we're making now is very much like that autocatalytic model that I showed you from our paper back in 1986. And so in this model, we take um, technologies, which you can think of as nodes. We arrange them in trophic levels based on their interactions. And, and the trophic level that we define has to do with the distance from some reference set of things like natural resources. And so we postulate there is a food chain in technologies so that things that are on the higher, higher on the food chain improve faster. And why is that? It's because any improvements lower in the chain tend to get passed up the chain and not vice versa. If you're making an end product and you make an improvement, a, a, a consumer good, well, that'll lower prices, but just by that amount. But if you make, say, an improvement in smelting steel, the improvement in smelting steel gets passed up to everything that's made out of steel in the whole economy. And um, so, indeed, 
we're trying to explain, if you look in a plot like this, where we look at technologies which turns out generally satisfy not just Wright's law, but Moore's law, then you can look at the halving time for the cost, which is plotted on the y-axis, and the doubling time for production, which is plotted on the x-axis, both in log scale. You have some technologies here, like computer technologies, that are improving extraordinarily fast, and other technologies here, like beer brewing, that are improving, but slowly. And why is that? Well, we argue it's due to this trophic level effect. And just to illustrate this schematically, we take technologies like petroleum and gas extraction, uh, which um, in the data we have, uh, have, have um, uh, actually gone up in price compared with, say, doll and toy and game manufacturing, where you're using plastic a lot. Uh, so it's a digested version of this. The, the price reduction is more, or even more dramatically, say, take the computer industry. We have sand, gravel, clay, and ceramic mining up here. And we have, so because we're plotting the return, which is that's if it's up here, the, the, the price went up. It's down here, the price went down. And computer manufacturing, which is the outlier down here, is um, dramatically, the cost is dramatically dropping, and the basic materials that computers built out of are only dropping a little. So um, I'm going to summarize by just saying that, and once again, I lost some of my text there. Uh, economics, I think, is fertile ground for network science. Um, a good model of economics requires a good model of people, and I think the kind of social network uh, stuff that's going on here will ultimately be really important for that. Um, but um, uh, there's a general problem in economics of the wilderness of bounded rationality that's been coped with by um, uh, making rational models in economics, which has the advantage of being parsimonious, but formulating such models is hard. And, but economists have been obsessed with that approach and understanding how to build models where they have equilibria based on rationality or, or some behavioral general, generalization of it. Um, but I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for models that avoid the need for behavioral assumptions at all. You notice the models I made today had essentially no behavioral assumptions in them. I'm just talking about things like the production structure of the economy or the interaction structure of the financial network. And I think in many cases, the structure is actually, actually more important than the strategies and can give you a first order explanation of what happened in the financial crisis without having to talk about greed and CEO compensation and, and you know, behavioral economics and so on. So with that, I'll end. <laughs>